All right, I want to officially welcome everyone uh, for tonight's program. My name is Samantha Lurie. I'm an adult services librarian for the Northville District Library. And tonight uh, we are having a discussion with the author of The Only Plane in the Sky, Garrett F. M. Graff. He's an award-winning journalist and historian. He's written many different articles and magazines like Politico, Wired, and, and several other books. But tonight we are talking about this New York Times bestseller, The Only Plane in the Sky. Welcome, Garrett. Thanks so much for having me. Okay, so we're gonna start with a few questions. Uh, from me, I'll just start asking you some questions and then we'll open up at, at the end for audience participation. So I guess the first question we kind of have to ask when we talk about 9-11 is where were you on that day? What do you remember? Sure, um, so why don't, uh, um, I, I can talk a little bit about where I am and then sort of how that fits into how this book came together. Yes, perfect. Um, because they are a little bit related in in that sense. Uh, so I have like a very boring 9-11 story. I was a college student in Boston. Uh, I was at breakfast when um, it must have been around 9.15, I now know, um, because a friend stopped by my breakfast table and said that two planes had crashed into the World Trade Center. Um, and, you know, it's a very quotidian memory of that day, except that it is still very much burned into my mind. And I can tell you, um, you know, I haven't been in that dining hall in 18 years, and yet that uh, I could walk into it tomorrow and walk directly to the table that I was sitting at that morning of 9-11. I could tell you everyone I was sitting with. I could tell you how my friend leaned on the table with her hand as she leaned over to tell us about that. Um, you, you know, some of this is, you know, putting yourself back in what 2001 was like, that we think of 9-11 as part of our modern age, but it was, you know, much more the 1990s than it was the 2000s. Um, it, you know, it is, in my mind, as clear a dividing line as we have between the 20th century and the 21st. And so 2001, um, I, I had a, you know, literal flip phone <laughs> as my cell phone. Um, and you checked your email when you were standing at a computer in the, um, you know, the lobby of the uh, student center or something like that. Like, but, you know, none of us had ubiquitous email that we were carrying around uh, at that time. And so 9-11 spreads that morning by word of mouth. And as that morning unfolds, I remember exactly uh, how that day unfolds. And I remember I was a student, uh, I, was a, uh, I was a reporter on the student newspaper. And so I uh, left breakfast, back, went back to my hotel, or went back to my dorm room, then went down to the student newspaper and I arrived at the student newspaper sometime between 10 a.m. and 10.15 or so and watched the TV news, very confused there uh, because I could only see one tower and I was trying to figure out mm -hmm. what the camera angle was that we were looking at where sort of the second tower was being completely blocked by the first tower. And then someone explained to me that actually the first tower had collapsed. I remember about an hour later exactly where I was when I saw the first photo of Osama bin Laden and uh, first heard the words Al Qaeda uh, in reference at least to that day. And again, I remember being so confused about how everyone on TV was so sure of this man and this thing attacking us because I had never heard of him. I had never heard of Al Qaeda. And that day, I remember as one of chaos and confusion. And here we are now, 20 years later, uh, just you know, a little past 20 years later um, on September 20th. And there is an entire generation who have grown up in the world uh, 
created by 9-11, but with no memory of the day itself. Um, and mm -hmm. that is, uh, been, we've been sort of reminded of that poignantly uh, this summer with the U.S. pullout of Afghanistan and the 13 servicemen and women killed in Kabul amid the pullout, 12 U.S. Marines, one Navy sailor, only two of them were out of diapers on 9-11. Um, I mean, that's how long this conflict has now been going on. And the history that we teach of 9-11 is a neat and simple and tidy one. We talk about it as this series of events, this um, four planes, the whole thing began at 846 uh, New York time with the crash of American Airlines Flight 11 into the North Tower. The whole thing is over 102 minutes later with the collapse of the second tower at 1028. We talk about Shanksville, we talk about the Pentagon, we talk about the, uh, the Twin Towers. And yet, for those of us who were alive that day, that's not the day that any of us actually remember. The, the day that we remember is one where we didn't know when the attacks began. We didn't know when they were over. For much of the day, we didn't even know how many attacks there had been. There were rumors of so many other incidents and attacks across the country, including a car bomb at the State Department, um, fears of as many of a, as a dozen other hijacker, uh, hijacked airliners spread across the country well into the early afternoon. And we didn't know sort of worst of all what came next we didn't know what wednesday held what october held what 2002 might hold and what really uh, is in my mind so important to understanding the memory of that day as we watch it slip 20 years on from memory into history is that this day was about so much more than the facts of the day and that this was a day of chaos and confusion and fear and trauma and that this was a situation where we uh, as a nation as a government as a people as a congress as a president uh, reacted with fear and panic and what we were reacting to what we were panicking over were not the facts of 9-11, but we were reacting to the emotion of 9-11. And so in my mind, what is so important about telling this book as an oral history is that it puts people back in the moment of what it was like to experience 9-11. Not as, as history, not as the facts of the day, but actually as the emotions of the day. And to me, that is the, the power of uh, this approach of, of taking these 480 people all across the country who experienced 9-11 from morning to night, coast to coast, and putting them back that day in the day knowing only what they actually knew as the day unfolded. Thank you. I was gonna mention that um, the inspiration for this book, you started writing an article in Politico about the perspective of the day from Air Force One. Um, what led you to write that story? And then what led you to kind of expand that into this kind of narrative? Yeah. Um, a great question and actually uh, very, uh, very related to what I was just talking about. Um, and so I started this book, this project in 2016, really, with this article that you mentioned, um, 2016, the 15th anniversary of 9-11, and doing just this one slice of being aboard Air Force One with President Bush that day. And I went out and interviewed 
28 or so people who were with the president and around the president that day. Um, the pilot of Air Force One, the White House Chief of Staff, Carl Rove, Ari Fleischer, um, the, the communications technicians aboard Air Force One, the press pool who were aboard Air Force One, the Secret Service agents with the president that day, the fighter pilot who ended up escorting uh, President Bush across the country. And that piece published for the 15th anniversary five years ago now. And it was the reaction to that piece that inspired me to turn this into this much larger book. Um, in part, actually, for the very reasons that I was just talking about, that I began to look at 9-11 differently in terms of the emotion of the day and the memory of that day. Um, and the, you know, the facts of the day are so well known and so well told. Um, you know, you look at something like the 9-11 Commission that spent you know, millions of dollars and hundreds of staff doing thousands of interviews um, and piecing together this sort of vast portrait of the exact tick-tock of how that day unfolds. But then uh, what, what stuck out to me when I did my original piece was the idea uh, of the reader reaction. And so I um, I heard from probably 300 people um, in the first couple of days after that article published. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, I think most people uh, vastly overestimate how many reader responses journalists get to articles. Um, it, you know, you can publish a big, thoughtful, beautiful feature story and be pretty happy if you hear from five people um, <laughs> that, that have read it and sort of reacted. Um, five people other than, you know, your parents and, you know, your coworkers and stuff. Um, and so, you know, getting the reaction that I got to that piece, getting 300 uh, letters and, and emails, um, you know, it's more than, you know, I've gotten in the whole rest of my career and everything else I've ever written in my entire life combined. Um, and and there were two that really stuck out with me. There was one um, letter from a mother who wrote, uh, she was a veteran and she had two children. They were seven and nine at the time. And she wrote that she had printed out my article and set it aside so that when her children were old enough to read it, they could discuss why mommy had left them to go off to war. Wow. Then there was another letter from another veteran, younger, an army guy, uh, who had done three tours, two in Afghanistan, one in Iraq, and he'd been in middle school on 9-11. And he said that he had never understood the trauma that the nation experienced on 9-11 until he saw the day through President Bush's eyes. And it was sort of those two letters in the context of this sort of much larger flood of stories that made me really stop and begin to think about how different the type of history that we teach of 9-11 is from the experience of living 9-11. And so my hope uh, in expanding that was to try to um, really sort of look at um, what that day was like to live, um, you know, what that day was like beyond the stories that we are used to hearing. And that to me was part of what was the most interesting work of this book was realizing that you had these moments that if they had happened on any other day in modern American history would be among the most dramatic things to have ever happened in modern American history. And yet on 9-11 are not even among the 10 or 12 um, most familiar, biggest stories that people are used to uh, 
hearing. Um, and I follow sort of three threads of those through the book. Um, one being the maritime evacuation of Lower Manhattan, which is this uh, Herculean effort, the largest maritime evacuation in world history, larger than the British evacuation of Dunkirk, that over the course of that morning, as people are trapped on the tip of Lower Manhattan by the collapse of the towers, this makeshift civilian armada, flotilla of about 130 boats from all across the maritime community in New York and New Jersey, pleasure yachts, fishing vessels, tugboats, passenger ferries, sightseeing, cruise boats, uh, comes together and, you know, with no plan, with no uh, real coordination, uh, begins to evacuate somewhere between 300,000 and 500,000 people. Um, and it is a story that uh, it is, you know, this incredible answer of how Americans came together on that day, you know, that offered so much of the worst of, uh, the worst of the evil that mankind can offer. And yet this group comes together and offers, you know, this testament of hope and, and love and, uh, and sort of community civic spirit to evacuate all of these strangers from the island. It's a story that we didn't have any real understanding of had happened until the 10th anniversary of 9-11. It was so buried and overlooked amid that day that it wasn't until the 10th anniversary when there was a 12 minute documentary released online that came out that people even really began to understand that it had happened at all. Um, and then you see, you know, in another thread that same day, this incredible work being done by the, um, uh, by the air traffic controllers who are tasked with wrestling back control of the nation's airspace. That morning, Ben Sliney, the National Operations Manager for the FAA, is in his first day on the job as the head of the nation's airspace. And in his first two hours at work, gives two orders that effectively no one has ever given before or since. The first, uh, shortly after the second crash, uh, in order to institute a nationwide ground stop, that every plane that is not yet in the air is going to be prohibited from taking off. Then around 9.42 in the crash at the Pentagon, uh, he issues a second order, land everything, land everything now. And every plane in the air at the time, 4,500 planes, is to be forced down at the closest available airport, regardless of the plane's destination and regardless of whether the airport is in any way able to, or prepared to receive those incoming planes. And so, you know, if Americans know this story at all, they really only know the tiny sliver of this story that is the 38 transatlantic flights forced down in Gander, Newfoundland, uh, that form the basis of the Broadway musical Come From Away, where you have uh, 7,000 people, passengers and crew, dropped into a remote island and with a population of 9,000 people, um, and sort of the way that that community comes together to protect and, uh, and, and serve and bathe and clothe this, uh, you know, this... 7,000 people who are dropped into the midst of their town. Um, and then you have, you know, the U.S. government's response. You know, the what Vice President Cheney was tr trying to muster in the bunker underneath the White House that morning, the fighter planes that are scrambled into the sky to try to intercept these planes. And, you know, these incredible dramatic stories that we just don't really have a good understanding of happening at all. Um, and to me, so much of that day is uh, about trying to capture and understand and tell uh, 
these little stories about how the day actually uh, the, these incredibly dramatic events that sort of unfold underneath and around the day that we are actually used to experiencing. Yeah, there was so much that happened that day. And, and honestly, these events that you're, you're speaking of, you could write whole books on just the maritime, you know, evacuation and, and any of these. How did you go about compiling all of these different stories? And what was the decision making process and figuring out which ones to use and which ones not to use? Yeah, so I ended up, um, so there were a whole lot of, uh, organizations and institutions that had the good foresight after 9-11 to go out and try to collect the stories of 9-11, sort of understanding that people would want these oral histories someday. Um, the the 9-11 Museum in New York, the 9-11 Tribute Center in New York, the uh, Pentagon historian, the Capitol Hill historian, uh, the Fire Department of New York did 300 oral histories with responding personnel there. The Flight 93 National Memorial did an enormous project in Pennsylvania. Uh, Columbia University, Stony Brook University. Um, and then there were an all number of smaller projects um, at local libraries and historical societies across the country. Um, and I give actually local libraries uh, an incredible uh, thank you in this because so many of them did a great job documenting their own community's uh, reaction that day. One of the best oral history projects in the entire country was done by the Arlington County Public Library. Um, just of sort of their own residents um, and uh, their experience with the Pentagon crash. And they, for the most part, went out and did the interviews and then everything sat on a shelf, um, sort of untouched and forgotten. And so I spent uh, the first year of this book project, um, I actually hired away from the 9-11 Museum a oral historian uh, named Jenny Pinchke, and she and I spent the first year of this project just going around and looking at those archives and collecting what we could find and and sort of figuring out who was in some of these archives. Um, there was, uh, in a lot of cases, no one had ever transcribed the interviews at all. So, you know, we were sitting mm -hmm. down with audio, tight, uh, audio tapes that no one had listened to since the day the interview was actually conducted. And they, um, we ended up finding all across, you know, nationwide about 5,000 uh, oral histories of that day and sorted it down in rough form to about 2,000 that we actually collected, transcribed, and began to wade into. And then the second year of the project was basically going through 2000 oral histories and sorting down to the uh, 480 that are actually in the book of which um, approximately 400 are archival oral histories. Um, and then I went out and did probably about 200 interviews uh, and stories that I collected myself that I, I ended up using about 80 of, um, and some of those, um, it, you know, that, uh, as you know, from reading the book, uh, it, it is a book where there are very few people that you actually follow through the whole day. Um, you know, there are probably only a couple dozen people that you follow morning to night on nine 11. And the rest just come and go, um, uh, in, in sort of the moments where their story really intersects the main narrative. And that was, you know, one of the advantages from a research and organizational perspective is there are a lot of people on 9-11 who have pretty representative stories of being you know, alive on 9-11. Um, you know, there are a lot of people in the World Trade Center who have experiences pretty similar to other people in the World Trade Center. There are 
a lot of people in the Pentagon or in Washington who have experiences pretty similar to other people in Washington. And then, you know, there are, you know, tens of millions or hundreds of millions of Americans who watch the thing unfold on TV. Um, and I've thought a lot about that, um, by the way, in the context of these last 18 months and thinking about how hard it's going to be for future historians to write about what this pandemic was like mm. because the, you know, 9-11 was in many ways a collective experience. Um, it, it was a global catastrophe unlike anything that we have ever experienced before or since. You know, the fact that these attacks occur at 9 a.m. Eastern time means that you know it was early afternoon and uh, mid-afternoon for Africa, Europe, and the Middle East. It means that it was early evening, late evening in most of Asia. And so sort of the whole world was able to effectively watch 9-11 unfold live. And it, so it, you know, in, in some ways, one of the most amazing experiences of this book, is realizing like how truly universal that has been. Um, you know, I, um, the, the book this year um, w was actually translated into a number of different foreign editions. Um, it came out in, in Polish, in Lithuanian, in uh, Portuguese for Brazil. Um, and, you know, I can talk to people in Poland, I can talk to people in Lithuania, I can talk to people in Brazil and recognize their experiences on 9-11. I mean, they sort of sound like the experiences of people that you are used to talking to about 9-11 in the United States. None of that is going to be true about this pandemic. You know, I, I live in Burlington, Vermont now. And, you know, my experience as a, uh, you know, parent, white collar writer in Vermont is not even necessarily representative of other people's pandemics on my block, um, you know, let alone, uh, you know, people in Michigan or Florida or South Dakota or New York City. And, you know, that this pandemic has been so, uh, uh, splintering, uh, not just in a political sense, not just in sort of a polarizing sense, but in a sort of atomic sense of the way that it has broken people down into individuals um, with so much uh, contingent upon, you know, their occupation, their health, uh, the state where they live, um, you know, their, their race. Um, and on, uh, you know, anyone, anyone who sort of comes back to uh, write about this pandemic, you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now, um, you know, you're, you're not even necessarily, you know, it, if you fully report out the story of, you know, one building in one city, like you will only have reported out the story of one building in one city. Right, versus 9-11, which was more like a, we were living the same event. Exactly. Sort of. Um, was there one particular story when you were going through the process of listening to these, you know, um, records of people's uh, histories um, that stood out to you or was there like a particular story that didn't make the cut necessarily, but still stuck with you? Yeah, so the stories that were uh, sort of most affecting for me in this project uh, were stories of the theme. Um, and it was the stories of luck. Um, mm. it, you know, what you depending on your religious persuasion, you know, might call faith or fate or chance. Uh, but there are so many small decisions that people make on the morning of 9-11 that uh, 
are the types of decisions that we as humans in the world make 1000 times a day without ever actually thinking about the alternate universes that we are unlocking with our choices. Um, when you get a cup of coffee, when you place a telephone call, when you run an errand, um, what bus you ride, what flight you book. Um, and we, you know, have no sense of whether the choices we are making are meaningful ones. Um, and we have no, ch no sense of whether we're in fact lucky. Um, the, uh, I start the book, um, one of the first stories that you encounter is Monica O'Leary, who on Monday, September 10th, is the unluckiest person at Cantor Fitzgerald, the uh, financial services firm atop the North Tower. And on Monday afternoon, September 10th, 2001, she's laid off. Um, you know, people sort of forget that the mm -hmm. nation was already sort of beginning to stumble into a recession um, that fall. And so she, uh, she's, she and sort of her unit are laid off uh, and she boxes up her stuff in her, you know, on her desk. She goes around, says goodbye to all of her coworkers. And then the next morning, she stands on the roof of her apartment building in New York City, uh, and she watches as the North Tower collapses at 1028, and 658 of her colleagues are killed. Two-thirds of the entire firm uh, are killed. And she comes back the next week she starts back at Cantor Fitzgerald um to help them rebuild and as it turns out she's never even been taken off payroll because all of the HR personnel who would have processed her termination on Tuesday morning uh are killed and you see this in the story of Michael LaMonaco the chef at Windows on the World mm -hmm. uh who uh, on that morning, on any morning, would have been at, in his kitchen around 8.30. Uh, but that morning of all mornings, he decides to stop and get a new pair of glasses at LensCrafters. And so that morning of all mornings, he ends up missing the last elevator up to his restaurant and 70 of his colleagues are killed and he lives. You see this in Seth MacFarlane, the creator of Family Guy, the comedian, um, who that morning uh, was, uh, the night before he'd done a gig in Providence, Rhode Island and was flying back from Boston to Los Angeles and was supposed to have been aboard American Airlines Flight 11. <laughs> and he, uh, this was 2001, again, going back to sort of where I started talking about with the, you know, the, there were no mo mobile boarding passes at the time. <laughs> you had a travel agent who typed out your itineraries for you. And his travel agent mistyped the departure time of the plane. And he arrives at Logan International Airport that morning after flight 11 had closed. He thinks nothing of it. He thinks he's, you know, had some bad luck and rebooks on the next flight and goes and falls asleep uh, in the um, in the airport lounge and wakes up about an hour later uh, as people around him start screaming. And, you know, thought he was really unlucky that morning. Turns out he was really lucky. Um, there's a... Um, there, there's a conference room at the Pentagon that I talk about in the book uh, that uh, uh, full of uh, army personnel, um, uh, people who do personnel for the army, um, not just people who are in the army, but people who do personnel for the army. And they're having their morning 9 a.m. staff meeting. Uh, the uh, American Airlines Flight 77 impacts their side of the building. 
their conference room, you know, instantly goes dark, erupts in flames and smoke, and they evacuate. And everyone who turns left coming out of that conference room dies, and everyone who turns right lives. And so to me, like, there's a, just this immense uh, emotional poignancy of these stories as people experience them and live them. Uh, and, and, you know, I sort of kept having these sort of feelings like, you know, you're watching the monster movie and you're like, don't go in the basement. Like, don't open the closet door. Like, you're trying to yell at these characters um, through the TV screen um, because, like, you know the fate that awaits them if they, you know, board that elevator, if they book that flight, if they make that boat. Um, and, uh, and so to me, it's just like this incredible sense of, of like what, you know, how you think about your daily life and what, what the alternate universes are that you could be unlocking as you go about your day. Mm -hmm. Well, I have more questions, but I think at this time we can open up to the audience. If anybody has a question, um, feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. Does anyone have a question? Okay, well, um, if something comes to you, feel free to ask, but I will add another question. I was thinking, you know, it, it's really hard for a lot of people to comprehend a, like, what life could be like, at, like not having lived through this day there's a lot of this new generation that's kind of like post 9-11 that doesn't really have a personal experience. Um, what would you hope for them to kind of um, understand about that day? Yeah, so I think that the, the answer is the fear, the chaos, the confusion, then the trauma of that day because the further we get from 9-11, um, the worse the decisions that we made after 9-11 look. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that the panic that we experienced as a people, as a government, as a nation, um, led us in a lot of very dark and uh, unfortunate uh paths um the the mishandling of the war in afghanistan the mishandling uh of the invasion and occupation of iraq uh the cia black sites the torture program the uh the prison at guantanamo bay um and it's really hard to it, it, it's really hard to look back 20 years later and justify those decisions. Um, and, you know, I, I wrote a, a piece for the Atlantic this year uh, for the anniversary about, you know, how I think we got almost everything wrong in the war on terror. Um, you know, we uh, unleashed a series of forces that, uh, you know, left the U.S. you know less free, uh, more morally compromised, and more alone in the world, uh, and especially more divided at home. Um, you know, we took this moment of extreme unity, both domestically and internationally, the only time in world history that NATO has ever invoked Article Five of its charter to say that an attack on one is an attack on all. And uh, yet that the, the forces that were unleashed afterward um, really divided us. Um, and, you know, we saw uh, 
particularly this strain of anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim, nativist, nationalist politics rise in the United States. Um, you know, we forget what, uh, you know, the, the sort of line from 9-11 to uh, birtherism and the idea that uh, Barack Obama is a you know, closet Kenyan Muslim who was raised in an Indonesian madrasa, um, you know, none of which is true. But mm -hmm. as Colin Powell, you know, rightly asked in the 2008 campaign during his endorsement uh, of President Obama on Meet the Press, so what if it was? Like, if, 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 if Barack Obama was a Muslim, uh, why should that make him ineligible for public office in the United States? Um, you know, what is it about uh, this population that we have now so demonized that we can see them only as terrorists? And that, you know, I think you can draw um, a very straight line from 9-11 to... Uh, the mishandling of the COVID pandemic in the U.S. Uh, and to the insurrection at the Capitol on January 6th. Um, and in my mind, um, you know, when you look at that dark legacy of 9-11, when you look at the mistakes that were made, uh, the only way that you can begin to explain them, the only way that you can begin to contextualize the decisions that the U.S. made after 9-11 is to understand the emotion mm. in 9-11. And so that's where I think that this book uh, sort of fits into this larger arc, that it is the story of a single day. You know, it starts in the morning, it ends in the evening, um, it's not trying to answer all of the questions about how we got to 9-11. Um, it, it's not trying to, you know, reckon with the future that we uh, made after 9-11. It's just trying to explain the emotion that our nation experienced on the day of Tuesday, se September the 11th. So I did get a question um, from Carol in the chat box, which... I'll just, I'll say again, I know I said you can unmute yourself, but you can also type your question into the chat and I will read it. So this is what she said. I know there was conflicting instructions given to the occupants of the towers following the planes crashing into them. How many people successfully evacuated from each of the towers? Um, so this this is a, a great question. Um, and it's actually one that I uh, spent a good chunk of this year answering. Um, and so I'm going to put a plug in here uh, in the chat. Um, if any of you are uh, podcast listeners, I actually uh, spent this summer, uh, this spring and summer working on a eight episode podcast series that published earlier this month um, that looks at the lingering questions of 9-11 um, and uh, questions that uh, where either the story has only become clear with the passage of time or the way that we uh, understood something in the wake of 9-11 has actually changed rather dramatically in the years since. So the first episode deals with the rescue at the World Trade Center um, and uh, you know how people were rescued and um, how the building actually collapsed. And then the other episodes deal with questions like what was the target of United Airlines Flight 93 um, who gave the order to shoot the plane down? Um, uh, what was the Saudi government's connection to the attacks? Who was the 20th hijacker? Um, things like that. And um, so the, the actual answer to Carol's question is uh, that almost everyone, uh, particularly in the North Tower, below the impact zone was able to successfully evacuate. Um, that the vast majority of the uh, casualties in both buildings were uh, 
people either in the impact zone or people who were uh, trapped above it. Because in both cases, the, um, the, the crash has sort of effectively severed all of the stairwells out of the uh, the uh, out of the area above the impact zone and so for me uh, the the story of the World Trade Center is this one of uh, you know sort of these two different experiences playing out the um, you know the people below uh, evacuating and then the people trapped above um, Part of that story, particularly in the South Tower, is the confusion over the conflicting in instructions about evacuating. Um, you know, the, and this is where you begin to see, you know, part of what makes that day so interesting to me is the 17 minutes between that first crash and the second crash, the uh, time from 8.46 to 9.03. When you see in that moment just how innocent America actually is. And what I mean by that um, is everyone sees that first crash and basically shrugs. Um, and that's true of New York commuters. That's true of uh, government uh, staff in Washington. And it's true even of President Bush in Sarasota, Florida that morning where he is reading to school children for an education event. And... So sort of everyone has some version of the same reaction. And if you were alive on 9-11 and heard about the attacks between 846 and 903, um, you probably have the same reaction. Probably a small plane. What a strange accident. Uh, maybe the pilot had a heart attack. Uh, maybe the plane had mechanical problems. Maybe air traffic control is having a really bad day. And so that day, though, what you see is in the South Tower the people don't default to thinking that it's terrorism. Um, people just sit at their desks and watch this conflagration across the plaza in the North Tower. And they, uh, they are actually instructed by the Port Authority to stay at their desks. Um, there are people, uh, tragically, at the Fuji Bank offices in the South Tower who start to evacuate uh, from the South Tower after the crash at the North Tower, and then uh, are uh, told to return to their desks. Um, the Port Authority actually puts out uh, you know, messages over the intercom system in the South Tower saying this incident is, is confined to the North Tower, you know, please go about your day. And so the employees of Fuji Bank start to evacuate, leave their floor, uh, and then turn around and go back to their desks and are in their offices at their desks when the plane, uh, uh, when United Airlines Flight 175 crashes uh, directly into their offices. Um, and, uh, you know, many of them uh, who might have survived if they had evacuated earlier um, actually end up getting killed that morning. Carol says, thank you for the excellent answer and the podcast link. Yes. I second the podcast. I'm big into those. All right. We have a question from Doug. How did you approach assembling 480 voices to read as a single cohesive narrative? Yeah. So this is, um, part of, part of sifting through those sort of 2000 stories was I was looking on the one hand for very representative stories, you know, sort of what was the typical person evacuating from the World Trade Center? Um, you know, what did that experience look like and who represents it well? Um, you know, what are the observations that you hear across lots of different people uh, talking about? Um, and then I was also looking for the highly atypical uh, decisions um, and, and experiences, the, the people who had truly remarkable 9-11s um, and were sort of particularly personally dramatic. And so, you know, one of the people that you follow through the whole book is uh, Will Jimeno, 
the Port Authority police officer that morning um, who is uh, one of just two people rescued from underneath the towers. And, um, you know, that sort of for much of that day, uh, after the collapse of the towers, there was this expectation that there were going to be m many, many injured. You know, that there were going to be lots of people trapped in the rubble, the, lots of people injured in the collapse. And the truth of the matter, as it turns out, is that the 9-11 was a uniquely devastating event and people either lived or died. Um, and there weren't no injuries, but there were nowhere near the number of injuries that people expected given the scale of the incident and the number of people, uh, you know, affected in those buildings on a, on a daily basis. So at the end of 9-11, there are just 18 people who were rescued from the Twin Towers um, after the collapse. Uh, almost all of them uh, in the uh, uh, the remnants of Stairwell B, um, which is another one of the episodes of the podcast. And it is uh, a, a group of firefighters who are trapped in the stairwell. And basically, um, uh, they're not trapped underneath the rubble. They're trapped on top of it. Like the whole building crumbles around them. And then there's this one tiny part of stairwell B around the fourth floor that survives and is intact. And so, uh, you know, the vast majority of the people who survived the collapse of the towers are actually on top of the rubble. Um, and it's only Will Jimeno and his Sergeant John McLaughlin who are rescued from underneath the tower. And so, uh, you know, we follow him all the way through that day and being buried in the, um, it, it buried in the rubble and then talking with him, you know, talking is, is the rescue efforts to, uh, to pull him from the rubble begin and, um, uh, and sort of this incredible day, um, uh, of, his story and how atypical it actually was. If anyone else has questions, feel free to put them into the chat box or unmute yourself and you can say it aloud. Um, but while we wait for that, um, in addition to the print book, I did get a chance to listen to the audio book and I thought it was um, very different from other audiobooks. As um, if those in the audience don't know, um, there was a compilation of I believe forty-five narrators, um, and it also included some archival audio. How did you go about uh, producing this a atypical audiobook? Yeah. So this was. Um... They did an incredible job, and I take mm -hmm. literally zero credit for it, because um, it was the uh, the audio uh, team at, at Simon and Schuster did this incredible job, and the um, it, uh, they actually won uh, you know best audio book of the year in in twenty twenty when the when the book came out, um, and, and as you said, it is this story of uh, forty five different narrators reading the different parts. Some of them actually the original you know, characters of 9-11 uh, reading their their own stories through that day. And, um, you know, the challenge that I gave the audio team was that I really wanted to make sure that this book reflected the tapestry of voices that the book captures. Um, you know, that you... You get such a better sense of that day uh, and the breadth and the scope and the scale of that day as you listen to people uh, talk about it from all different walks of life. I mean, all different classes, education levels, um, all different races, ethnicities. Um, you know, you've got your, you know, Boston air traffic controllers with their thick Boston accents. You've got your, you know, 
uh, Italian and Irish, you know, New York firefighters and police officers. Um, you know, you've got your uh, Southern blacks at the, the Pentagon. Um, and uh, then, you know, even even Shanksville, you know, this, um, you know, these rural communities around uh, Shanksville where United Airlines Flight 93 crashes. Um, you know, you, uh, you know, you have this, you know, unique, uh, Western Pennsylvania, uh, accent, um, if, if you know your sort of American dialects and accents. And so what you have, uh, in that audio is a sense of just how big 9-11 actually was and how, uh, global and unrelenting it was as an event that people uh, uh, of this breadth and scale and, and scope were all affected by that day, trying to respond to that day, trying to make sense of that day. Um, not taking anything away from your book, but uh, there's Lots of other, you know, books on this topic and documentaries. You mentioned a few already, um, but is there like a particular documentary or another book that you may have read that uh, you found particularly moving or would recommend to our audience here? Yeah, so a couple of different suggestions. One is um, I'm just uh, about tonight uh, to finish the Netflix Turning Point documentary. Mm -hmm. um, uh, which is a, I think it's a five episode series looking at 9-11 uh, and uh, sort of what came before and what came after. Um, and I think it was just incredibly well done um, and uh, very historically rigorous, very thoughtful. Um, I, I know the producer of it um, and was actually interviewed for it. Um, and I emailed him today about just how I uh, wouldn't have changed any of it. I think he's, he uh, did a great job telling it. Um, uh, 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 Book-wise, I also really strongly recommend um, there is uh, a book uh, specifically on the uh, the maritime evacuation that's called, uh, um, it was originally published as Dust to Deliverance and was just reissued for the 20th anniversary under the title Saved by the Seawall. Um, and if, if you like only playing in the sky and want to dive deeper into the maritime evacuation or were intrigued by the comments that I was making tonight about it, it's a great way to, um, to learn more about that story. Um, and, it, and it's actually written by, um, a, a woman who is, uh, you know, basically a member of the maritime community in, uh, in New York City. So it's sort of very authentically told. Another question from Doug. This was a profoundly emotional reading experience. How are you affected by working so closely with these stories for such a long period of time? Yeah, so this is, uh, this is I think, actually, this is, uh, this is a great question to end on uh, tonight because it, mm -hmm. it, it is actually, to me, the... the uh, uh, 9-11 is this day of like incalculable tragedy and sorrow. Um, and it is a day of uh, stunning surprise and loss. Um, and yet taken as a whole, and I hope if you read the whole book, you sort of come away with some sense of this. Uh, it, it's a day that's also filled with incredible hope and love and testimonies to the resilience of the human spirit. Um, and um, I actually, uh, um, I'm gonna plug one other thing that I did this year um, uh, about uh, um, for, for the 20th anniversary, I went back and wrote uh, about Will Jimeno, the police officer I was talking about earlier, um, who has this incredible story not of surviving the collapse of the World Trade Center, but what he's done since. And that he is forthright about the challenge that he has faced with PTSD and the years of battles uh, 
that he has had with PTSD uh, since the World Trade Center, since 2001. And what he talks about is how he came to this realization that he was not going to be defined by the idea that the buildings fell on top of him. He was going to be defined by what he did despite the buildings falling on him. And so he has spent most of the last 10 years uh, going around as a uh, motivational speaker, not to like fancy private uh, uh, corporate gigs, but to places where people are in struggle. Um, you know, substance abuse centers, rehab facilities, um, uh, addiction centers, uh, uh, jail inmates, um, you know, he's T talks to police academies, military uh, recruits, um, and even a lot of like elementary, middle school, and high school students. And what he talks about is the idea that trauma is not competitive or comparative. And that he had the literal World Trade Center fall on top of him. 220 stories of the World Trade Center fell on top of him. When you have something bad happen in your life, when you experience trauma, it is going to feel like the World Trade Center has fallen on top of you. And for you, that trauma could be, uh, you know, the, the death of a loved one, the loss of a job, a bad breakup, a divorce, you know, your, your own struggles with addiction. Um, it, it could be, you know, actually... Uh, you know, military uh, PTSD or um, uh, something of that uh, nature. Uh, and, you know, as a student, like, it can, you know, be the final exam next week that, like, you don't know <clears throat> that you can, you don't know if you are going to make your way through it. And, you know, you don't know whether you will have a future on the other side of passing you know, organic chemistry or like whatever the class is that you are struggling with. And that for you in those moments, like that's going to be as bad as it gets. And that's going to feel like the World Trade Center has fallen on top of you. And that, you know, human life and our world is about making your way through that and coming out the other side. And sort of the one guarantee of life is that basically all of us are going to experience a moment where the World Trade Center feels like it is falling on top of us. And for Will Jimeno, it just like actually happened to literally be the World Trade Center falling on top of him. Um, and so his story of... Um, <laughs> what it's like to live after 9-11 is to me, you know, part of the reason that I can write about this and study this and, and try to share these stories. Um, because to me, like 9-11 is a story that is actually filled with just an immense amount of uh, love and hope. And um, I, 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 uh, the way that we as a country and as a people answer the worst of the day with the best of humanity. So uh, that's uh, that to me is sort of the arc of 9-11 and I think the, the important part of trying to hold on to it 20 years later. Yeah, thank you. And that's, like you said, this pretty great way to kind of bookend this discussion. Um, so I do want to thank you for discussing uh, the only plane in the sky with us. And thank you for everyone's questions. They were great. Um, but before we say goodbye to you, Garrett, did you want to plug your next project? Uh, sure. So uh, I have um, uh, I have a book coming out in February that is uh, about another one of uh, America's major hinge moments, uh, the, a one volume history of Watergate. Um, and sort of all of the weirdness and wackiness of that scandal um, that will be out in February. So um, I hope you'll be able to get it at your local public library. I'm sure you will. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time.
And thank you for people who came and spread the word. We are we did record it, so uh, you can watch it again and check out those podcasts and those documentaries. Great. Thanks so much, Samantha. Thanks, everyone, for, for joining us. And thanks for spending some of your Monday evening with me. Thank you. Right. Bye. Bye-bye.